Good morning, everybody. As I always usually say to start off, just giving it a moment for those of you to join the, the Zoom webinar today. Uh, thanks for being with us for Grand Rounds. We have a really fun presentation. Before that, we do have just a couple of uh, updates for you. Um, I'll turn over actually to Niaz uh, Banai. He's the medical director of our uh, pathology and microbiology um, uh, departments. And he has some uh, interesting updates for us about the cellular immune response to SARS-CoV-2 uh, with this assay. So thanks, Niaz, for being with us. Yeah, as you're still on mute, just. Thanks, sorry, Errol. No. Um, so as you guys recall, early in the pandemic, the laboratory started to offer a serology assay to detect IgG and IgM to SARS-CoV-2. And when positive, it reflects to a blocking assay, which is equivalent of a, a virus neutralization assay. But um, about a year ago, we also went live with a T cell assay that tells us whether individuals have a T cell response to SARS-CoV-2. And um, as you know, the blocking antibody is um, a correlate of protection. And there is a number of um, observational studies that suggest T cells are also correlate of protection. And there is more, um, there's um, studies like this that show patients with no B cells at all can recover from COVID-19, which suggests that their T cells must be um, mediating their protection. And then the vaccine trial from the Pfizer vaccine showed protection starting on day 10. What's interesting is that on day 10, you can't, patients, I mean, the volunteers did not have a blocking or a neutralizing antibody. What they did have on day 10 was uh, nearly all of the vaccinees had a T cell response, which pretty is, um, convincing evidence that the T cells play an important role in addition to B cell tumoral response. So um, here's an assay that went live about a year ago. Basically, whole blood is taken and spiked with um, antigens from peptides from SARS-CoV-2 and antigen-presenting cells. Present these peptides with overnight stimulation of CD4 and CD8 T cells. And the following day, we measure the interferon gamma response as a measure of sensitization. And so in convalescence from the Lambda, Lambda trial that you are familiar with, with both the T cell assay and the IgG response early on after um, infections within the first month, both T cell and B cell responses are pretty sensitive, close to 100%. Great. But um, by 10 months post, con post infection and convalescence, the T cell response is about 80% sensitive. The IgG drops down to 70% and it will continue to drop. And this is pretty well documented. So, what about in our um, patients that are? Um, getting vaccinated, particularly immunocompromised, what is the vaccine response in them? So just to show you some um, data on immunocompetent individuals with our assays, um, this is a cohort of immunocompetent individuals two weeks after their second um, mRNA vaccine, essentially everyone has a really robust IgG response. The percent blocking activity is, is positive and essentially in everybody in this group, but by five months, everyone is on their way down. And in contrast with the T cell response, um, you see a very heterogeneous response. Um, some individuals respond and they maintain it and a portion um, respond, but they go down. So what does this teach us about um, response in immunocompromised patients at Stanford Healthcare? So we have now data from over 300 immunocompromised patients. You can see there are various categories of immunocompromised status. And what's really um, remarkable is that if you look at the immunocompromised group as a whole, 20% of them after the second dose of um, mRNA vaccine have a blocking activity. In contrast, 70% um, have a T cell response after their second dose. And then if you look at um, groups such as uh, heme malignancy patients that have active disease, essentially 0% um, of them have a positive blocking activity in contrast to 50% with a T cell response. And um, if you look at the response after the third dose in those immunocompromised patients that didn't have a response after their second dose, what you notice is that with the T cell response, you only have about um, 50 patients in this group. So the ones that um, didn't have a T cell response after second dose, after the third dose, there's a 20% conversion rate. And then for those that didn't have a blocking activity after the second dose, 36% convert after the third dose. 
I should uh, mention that this is uh, about 30 days, median of 30 days after the third dose. What we know is that if you wait a few months, this will definitely drop down further. So um, this is pretty much what I wanted to update you on. I get I got an email from a, one of our patients, is a lymphoma patient who has had three um, Pfizer vaccine shots, and um, after each one, her IgG is very negative, and also she has zero blocking activity based on this result. But look at her T cell response after the third dose is extremely positive. So. This were, if this patient were me, I would feel pretty com comfortable knowing that I have a really robust response. And um, her question was whether she could leave our house and have a semi-normal life. So just wanna thank people that have contributed to this work. Um, Ken Agawal, Mary Wilson developed this assay and then our pathology residents that are doing data analysis, Ram uh, Ramanathan, Christina Costales, Lou Yang, Philip Volteris, and then our um, Lambda trial. Um, team, and I'll stop here. Thanks. Thanks, Dr. Benai. That was really uh, some great information. I appreciate appreciate you sharing it with us. I was even mentioning at some point down the line, this would, this information might make for a great grand round. So please uh, consider that as well. Um, I'm going to turn over now, oh, Dr. Harrington, but also uh, Dr. Robinson, who's our, as you know, division chief of rheumatology, who's going to help us honor one of our faculty members, alumni who recently passed away. I'll turn it over to you next, Dr. Dr. Robinson. Great, thank you so much. Um, I have a slide to share here. So um, it's with a heavy heart that I announced the passing of James F. Fries. Uh, Jim joined the faculty of Stanford uh, in 1970 and was really a giant in the field of rheumatology as well as in life. Uh, he passed peacefully this past weekend uh, at his nursing home in Colorado, surrounded by family. And fittingly, his, his passing uh, coincided with the annual college, annual uh, meeting of the American College of Rheumatology. Uh, Jim was a world leader uh, in outcomes measures, and he created uh, the Stanford Health Assessment Questionnaire, which became known as the Hack Score and was widely used in the field as and still is today as a very uh, kind of standard outcome measure in rheumatology uh, and in many other diseases. Jim was also uh, very well uh, known for his compression of morbidity hypothesis. And this uh, hypothesis is, is that primary prevention factors have a greater effect on morbidity than on mortality. And that chronic diseases with onset later in life will be present for a shorter period of time, decreasing lifetime morbidity. So basically, if you live a healthy life and uh, take care of yourself and prevent diseases from ongoing, um, th that whole effect of the diseases you will eventually experience are all compressed to, to the end of life, and it also extends your life. And based on this kind of overarching hypothesis, Jim wrote 11 different books, many of which were extremely popular kind of uh, semi-bestsellers all about low, well living and uh, self-help. And so this is just a tribute uh, Jim and his passing. There will be a celebration of life in the summer of 2022, and uh, that will be uh, broadly announced uh, to the department. Uh, thank you. Thanks so much, Dr. Robinson, for helping us honor his life. We appreciate that. Uh, next, I'll turn it over to Dr. Harrington, who will help us start off with some updates. We do have, um, uh, us, actually, we'll be sending out some information. We're just working out specifics for next week's presentation. Um, and then also a, a reminder again, uh, no medical grand rounds uh, following week for Thanksgiving and following uh, we have our in-person, another in-person uh, hybrid plus Zoom grand rounds to start off December uh, honoring the Hewlett Award. So we'll have more information on that. Um, next, I will turn it over to Dr. Harrington who will start kick us off on uh, honoring our main presenters today. Thank you, Errol, very much. And uh, thank you, Bill, for uh, reminding us of the fantastic contributions of our colleague, uh, Jim Free. So uh, thank you for taking a moment to do that. Um, it's really a pleasure to, uh, to introduce uh, one of the speakers today, who then introduced the other two, uh, to talk about 50 years, celebrating 50 years of Stanford nephrology. Um, Glenn Chertow is a native of uh, Brooklyn, New York. He spent much of his educational life on the East Coast at Penn, at Harvard, at the Brigham, uh, before our colleagues to the North, UCSF, were wise enough to recruit him West. 
We then were wiser at Stanford and recruited him in 2007 to uh, chair the, uh, the renal division uh, in the Department of Medicine. And Glenn was an absolutely spectacular leader of, uh, of the renal division for almost 15 years. Glenn has then stepped up uh, when I requested him to do so to help us with uh, something he's really fantastic at, and that is mentorship. Um, and mentorship of fellows as they move to faculty roles as faculty as they're in their junior faculty years. <clears throat> he's terrific in his own right as a clinical investigator, but he's equally terrific at helping others become investigators, physician investigators. Um, Glenn is now the associate chair for fellowship program direction. Oh, so I'm going to turn it over to you, Glenn, to introduce your colleagues, our colleagues, and uh, I look forward to Grand Rounds this morning. Thank you, Dr. Harrington, and thank you, Dr. Ozdalga. Um, first, I'll introduce uh, the first speaker, Dr. Rex Jameson. Uh, Dr. Jameson received his undergraduate degrees from the University of Iowa and Oxford, where he was a Rhodes Scholar, before attending Harvard Medical School, where he graduated in 1960. He completed his internship and first year of residency in internal medicine at Massachusetts General Hospital, in his final year of res residency at Columbia before embarking on a three-year fellowship at the Laboratory of Kidney and Electrolyte Metabolism at the National Heart Institute. Dr. Jameson secured his first faculty position at Washington University in St. Louis, where he was chief of the division of nephrology at the Jewish Hospital. Dr. Jameson began his Stanford career in 1971 as co-director of the division of nephrology with the esteemed late Dr. Roy Mathley and directed the research training program, which I proudly inherited more than 30 years later, and on which he continues to play a substantive role. Dr. Jameson led the division as chief until 1987, while also serving as acting department chair from 1984 through 1986, before briefly leaving to serve as chair of the Department of Medicine at the University of Rochester from 1987 to 1992. He then returned to Stanford, where he served as professor of medicine and Director of Dialysis at the Palo Alto VA until 2003. Since then, Dr. Jameson has held the title of Professor of, of Medicine Emeritus, maintaining an active teaching presence, and for several years was deeply engaged in the VA Cooperative Studies Program after a long and distinguished basic science research career. Dr. Jameson later held the prestigious post of Academic Secretary for the University, fulfilling the role of legislative archivist and parliamentarian to the Faculty Senate, as well as the Academic Council and its committees. I personally and our entire division collectively celebrate Dr. Jameson's fundamental contributions to Stanford nephrology and his standing as one of the world's leading kidney scientists of the 20th century. Now I'll move on, Dr. Tara Chang. Uh, Dr. Chang, received her undergraduate degree from Harvard College and attended medical school at the University of Michigan. She completed residency in internal medicine at the University of California, San Francisco, and wisely chose Stanford for fellowship training in nephrology starting in 2007. After completing clinical and research training in nephrology, Dr. Chang completed a second fellowship in cardiovascular outcomes research under the direction of Dr. Mark Ladke. In the decades since her appointment to the Stanford faculty, Dr. Cheng's career has taken a meteoric rise. Currently Associate Professor of Medicine, Dr. Cheng served for five years as the Division's Director of Clinical Research, and more recently as the Division's sixth and current chief. Outside of Stanford, Dr. Cheng has served in several leadership roles with the American Heart Association, American Society of Nephrology, and National Kidney Foundation and on several work groups for KDGO, the Kidney Disease Improving Global Outcomes, the organization responsible for developing clinical practice yeah. guidelines in nephrology. Dr. Chang has been recognized as one of the world's leading authorities at the nexus of kidney and cardiovascular disease. In addition to her considerable prowess as a clinical investigator, Dr. Chang is also an accomplished clinician, deeply committed educator, and treasured mentor and will be leading the bulk of the presentation today. Thank, thanks so much, Dr. Tao. We'll stop, um, we'll turn it over to Dr. Chang and, and uh, Dr. Uh, um, Jameson as well. 
Thank you. Uh, thank you, Glenn. Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you to Medical Grand Rounds to join us in celebrating the 50th <clears throat> anniversary of the Division of Nephrology founded in 1971. <clears throat> I will state our mission, then give a brief history of nephrology as a specialty, and then highlight some achievements by our faculty in the first 15 years. <clears throat> as shown in this slide, the mission of the Stanford Division is to provide outstanding care to persons with kidney disease, to train future leaders and innovators in <clears throat> and innovators, and to nurture basic translational and clinical research to advance knowledge of kidney disease. <clears throat> Next slide, please. Nephrology is a comparatively young specialty. Its predecessors were clinicians who treated patients with <clears throat> water and electrolyte disorders. In 1972, Congress amended the Social Security Act to include payment for dialysis treatments, and that spurred the growth of the specialty. <clears throat> we were awarded our first NIH training grant in 1980 it's been <clears throat> continuously renewed since then. The current grant extends to 2025, a total of 45 years. NIDDK, the National Institute of Diabetes, Digestive and Kidney Disease, was founded in 1986. In 1954, Joe Murray performed the first human kidney transplant and continued its work, and in 1990 was awarded the Nobel Prize. The first kidney transplant on the West Coast between adults was at Stanford in 1960. It, <clears throat> the program continued intermittently, and then in 1991, the present transplant program was established. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Thanks to Roy Maffley's recommendation, Hal Holman, chairman of the Department of Medicine, recruited me in 1971. The offer to come to Stanford and work with Roy to build a division was a wonderful opportunity, and I shall always be grateful to Roy. Roy, who died in 2019, was a wise counselor and wonderful teacher. He had a deep sense of social justice and was the first medical school faculty to be awarded the university's Walter J. Gorge Award. <clears throat> On the right-hand side of the slide, <clears throat> and a lower part, I directed the homocysteine trial, a multi-center randomized clinical trial to see if lowering plasma homocysteine in patients with chronic kidney disease and end-stage renal disease reduced their mortality. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Roy and I described a new model of the urinary concentrating mechanism by Coco and Rector in 1976. These three publications represent my research contributions in three areas and are the result of many trainees and faculty, among them Tom Pallone now at Maryland and Channing Robertson, both professor and former chair of Stanford's Department of Chemical Engineering, pictured here in the upper part of the slide. Channing's expertise was essential to the research we did, and his sense of humor made it fun. He later collaborated with other faculty colleagues, Brian Myers and Tim Meyer. It was my good fortune uh, to have Christina Blount also pictured to join my lab. She was an exceptional research assistant who did the demanding analyses and taught the trainees first in my lab and then with Brian Myers, a total of 31 years. Next slide, please. Ralph Rabkin was section chief of nephrology at the Santa Clara Valley Medical Center and then the Palo Alto Veterans Hospital. Hospital. 
and strengthen the clinical and research programs of both institutions. He was an authority on peptide hormone action in kidney disease and showed how resistance to growth hormone and insulin-like growth factor causes skeletal muscle wasting in uremia and how exercise and amino acids correct the wasting. And he translated these findings to a clinical program of home-based exercises that significantly improve the quality of lives of patients with end-stage kidney disease. <clears throat> On the right, our nephrology fellows rotated through Santa Clara Valley Medical Center with its many patients and wide variety of kidney disease. And especially because Jeff Young, who succeeded Ralph as chief of nephrology for 28 years, led a group of superb clinical teachers now numbering eight, seven of whom were Stanford trainees. Next slide, please. I met Brian Myers when he was on sabbatical leave at UCSF from Tel Aviv. Brian was an outstanding clinician who at the age of 40, wanted to try scholarly work. Thanks to fortuitous events, we were able to recruit him to stand. I quote David Salant, distinguished nephrologist from Boston University, quote, in the realm of glomerular pathophysiology, Brian Myers is regarded as a Renaissance man. Before the term translational medicine was fashionable, Brian was doing it. With Alan Michaels of chemical engineering at Stanford and Bill Dean at MIT, Brian applied the member of principles of membrane permeability to study the defects in the glomerular filtration barrier that caused proteinuria. Such studies had been done in experimental model, uh, animal models, but not in patients. His method involved analyses of the fractional clearance of a family of dextrins, as illustrated in the figure. Brian proposed that filtration through glomeruli occurs primarily through small pores that restrict solutes based on their size and electrical charge, and also through a few large pores that formed a shunt pathway. Next slide, please. Using this model, Brian and his colleagues showed how a loss of selectivity by the small pores and an increase in the number of large pores allows filtration of albumin and other plasma proteins in a broad range of proteinuric kidney diseases as shown here. This work has stood the test of time. With advances in morphological techniques, we have been able actually to see the hypothetical pores he identified 40 years ago. All of this work was accomplished after his arrival at Stanford in 1976. For this and his clinical contributions, Brian was awarded Stanford's Albumin, excuse me, Albion Walter Hewlett Award. I now turn this over to Glenn. Thank you, Dr. Jameson. Um, there are many things about which our division is proud. Um, first and foremost among them is the success of our kidney and pancreas transplant program, which as you heard was formally established in 1991. We have a relatively large program, but one whose quality has been at the very top of national figures uh, over the last uh, decade or more. Next slide, please. Um, I'd like to very briefly describe um, one of our treasured colleagues, uh, Dr. Timothy Meyer, uh, who recently became a Professor Emeritus. As many of you know, he was the inaugural recipient of the department's Master Teacher Award, um, a perennial division teaching awardee, and a superb investigator. Um, many of you are aware of his, uh, of his work searching for and uh, understanding complications of uremic toxins. Um, before uh, he worked on uremia, he was one of the leading investigators uh, in kidney progression, as we used to call them progressionists. And you can see the 
the first paper listed on the right from JCI um, and our own Richard Lafayette was the lead author in an uh, off-cited paper in JCI studying the role of uh, RAS inhibitors in glomerular injury. Next slide, please. Well, I had the privilege of coming to Stanford in 2007 um, and being appointed as division head and promptly plucked um, several of my most outstanding colleagues from my two former institutions, after which um, you can see along the spectrum, um, we began growing our division, which increased in size from seven to 28. I should note that when I came, we had a phenomenal core of faculty members, including Dr. Scandling and Tan in kidney transplantation, Drs. Lafayette, uh, Iming Lit, and uh, Meyer in general nephrology. And after recruiting a few people from outside, began building our program from within. And you can see that and a couple of strategic outside recruitments has led to our division now reaching a size of 28 faculty members. Next slide, please. Over this time frame, we've also increased the breadth and depth of our research um, uh, endeavors, as you can see, uh, spanning from common to um, more focused uh, areas of kidney disease, transplant and non-transplant kidney disease, health policy, basic research, and even uh, some AI and machine learning. Uh, and with now, I'll, uh, now I'll pass the baton to Dr. Chang to uh, cover the present and future of Stanford Nephrology. Great. Um, well, thank you, Glenn. Um, and thank you also for your very kind introduction earlier today. So what is next for Stanford Nephrology? So I would say that in nephrology in general, it's a really um, exciting time to be involved with kidney care. And I would say that it's really a dawn of a new era in terms of the treatments um, for, key, for CKD and for the complications associated with CKD. So this figure is showing you a schematic of some selected major clinical trials in nephrology over the past 20 years. And as we know, the, uh, we use ARBs. And that work really came from 20 years ago with the IDNT and Renal trials back in 2001, showing a benefit of drugs like Herbisartan and Losartan. But after that positive intervention, there was a period of time when many of the intervention studies were largely uh, negative. Now, we still learned some important things from there. For example, the ATN trial in 2008 taught us that more dialysis in an intensive care unit setting was not necessarily a good thing but really a bit of a drought when it came to uh, having new treatments that could help to slow CKD progression. But I would say that in the last several years, all of that has really changed and has continued to, um, to, to, has continued to change. So starting in 2017 with some of these drugs that were really initially targeted towards uh, glycemic control, drugs like GLP-1 agonists, SGLT-2 inhibitors, MRAs, um, have all shown to be exceptionally beneficial for uh, slowing the progression of diabetic kidney disease, as well as more broadly, chronic kidney disease. And there have also been um, uh, newer studies looking at novel treatments for anemia associated with chronic kidney disease, or for how we manage diuretics in advanced kidney disease. Some of these just presented at last week's uh, national meeting at ASN Kidney Week. And so it's, it's really, uh, like I said, a, a really exciting time. I also did just want to point out that many of these major trials were led by folks here at Stanford. So as Dr. Jameson mentioned, he was the PI of the host trial back in 2007. Dr. Richard Lafayette was on the steering committee of Mentor, which was looking at the use of rituximab for membranous nephropathy. And then of course, Dr. Chertow will never like to toot his own horn, so I'll do it for him, but he really is uh, just a giant in our field and has uh, was either the PI or on the steering committee, along with several other members of the Stanford community in many of these trials. I often joke that you can't really open an, a, a, a New England journal without seeing Glenn's name on, on some major study. And so at Stanford, we will continue to look at ways to innovate when it comes to the treatment of our patients with CKD. And so this is one example 
of a program, the Tolerance Induction Program, which is really based on the work of Dr. Sam Strober, who is in uh, Bill Robinson's division in immunology and rheumatology, but really represents a, a, a great example of a partnership among rheumatology, transplant nephrology, transplant surgery, BMT and pathology. And what this program did was took uh, uh, patients who received a kidney transplant and after that, had them undergo total lymphoid irradiation and infusion of donor hematopoietic progenitor cells after the transplant. And that part's important because it allowed the application of this program in patients who are getting a deceased donor when you can't predict when that kidney might come for them, which is the majority of our kidney transplants here. The goal was to induce a mixed chimerism so that these patients would no longer need to take their immunosuppressive medications, which as we know, are highly effective at pre preventing rejection, but can lead to chronic kidney disease um, down the road. And what this uh, figure is showing you are results from the first wave, uh, or the first phase, I should say, of their trials, which looked at um, HLA matched donor recipient pairs. And if you just focus on the blue lines, those shows those patients who have remained off immunosuppression for mm -hmm. three, five, 10, or uh, 10 years or more. And there are ongoing studies now uh, that are looking at doing tolerance induction program in HLA mismatched pairs. We also have several other laboratories that are focused on this translational work. So doctors uh, Jonathan Maltzman and Lauren Higdon have labs that are looking at regulatory T cell development, immune aging, and like many of the investigators here at Stanford during the pandemic, they were able to pivot their work quickly uh, to look at immune responses uh, to SARS-CoV infection or to COVID vaccinations in uh, those patients who have solid organ transplants. Dr. Vivek Bala is looking at insulin signaling and SGLT2 and maybe trying to understand why these drugs seem to work so well in our patients. Um, and that's part of his broader program looking at diabetic nephropathy as well as diuretic resistance and sodium transport as it relates to hypertension. And Dr. Tammy Sirich, shown here with her beloved mass spectrometer, um, is using that machine to identify uremic solutes. And she's also using this to, to try to understand whether we need to do the usual three times a week hemodialysis in all of our patients. We might not, you know, twice weekly may be enough. And she's been able to actually take that work, looking at twice weekly hemodialysis, and created an app that we as nephrologists can have in real time and use to calculate how long, you know, how, how long and how often do our patients need to be on dialysis and still meet what's considered to be our minimum requirements. We have a strong history in epidemiology and health services research. In addition to Glenn and myself, uh, Dr. Manju Tamora, Ginny Ree, Mitch Lunn, Colin Lenahan, just to name a few, are all doing very important work using some of our existing data sets that are available here at Stanford. And I just wanted to take a minute again to, <laughs> to uh, uh, really point out the fact that, um, you know, now we take it for granted that sure, CKD and AKI are risk factors for poor outcomes like death and cardiovascular events and things. But, it, you know, 10, 15 years ago, that wasn't necessarily recognized. And really, it was Glenn's work, some of his early work that really helped to draw attention to, um, to those associations. And what you're seeing here is a very highly cited study from 2004 in the New England Journal that used data from Kaiser showing an association of lower estimated GFR and higher risks of death. And similar findings that even a very small change in uh, acute change in your creatinine of 0.3 is associated with higher odds of death. And none of our work, uh, much of our work, I should say, really is thanks to our incredible biostatistics core uh, that we have in nephrology and of which I'm very proud. And that's led by Dr. Maria Montes rath as well as Dr. Margaret Stedman. We also have um, three analysts who are just incredible, Sai Lu, Colin Han, and Jin Thomas, who really elevate the quality of our work. I want to take a minute to point out uh, some of the work of Dr. Shuchi Anand, who has really taken uh, taken the influence, I should say, of Stanford um, beyond our borders, and really with her work in global health. And so, several years ago, it was it was recognized that there were. Um, very high incidence of chronic kidney disease, particularly among younger men in some of these countries that were near the equator. 
and there seemed to be an association with um, agricultural work as well. And this disease has been termed a chronic kidney disease of unknown etiology or CKDU. And on biopsy, which is what you're seeing here, it looks like a fairly nonspecific chronic interstitial nephritis. And so Dr. Anand uh, was interested in this phenomenon and uh, took her research to Sri Lanka, which is one of these hotspots and has really been trying to understand the factors that are associated with the development of CKDU. And through that work, she was able to recognize that, you know, many of those characteristics are shared in our own backyard. And so through a very um, clever analysis using some of the publicly available data was able to show that there are also CKD hotspots right here in California in the Central Valley as shown by these darker red areas. And that these hotspots do seem to coincide with areas in which the well water has higher le levels of nitrates, uh, which may stem from pesticide exposures, et cetera. And that work is ongoing. And she's been able to take her, her uh, research and really bring it into the clinic by establishing the Center for Tubular Interstitial Kidney Disease, which she now leads along with Drs. Uh, Saul Lee and Susan Zolkowski. And there's, you know, even though this was uh, based on work from uh, around the world, there are implications for this disease process in onconephrology, in immune-related toxicities, as well as in some of the genetic disorders such as autosomal dominant polycystic disease and autosomal dominant uh, tubular interstitial kidney disease. And again, we have many examples in our division that really shows this um, synergy between clinical care and research. So we have a hypertension center that was established by Dr. Vala and is also led by Dr. Robert Isom uh, and really involves 30 faculty from 12 specialties that spans the entire school of medicine, including surgery and, and other um, other areas. And there's research going on that's focused on aldosterone, univascular disease. And we have a partnership now with uh, Dr. Mintu Tarakia and the Center for Digital Health, looking at how to bring uh, remote patient monitoring um, uh, to become a reality in terms of blood pressure management. Dr. Richard Lafayette and Famita Kamal helped to head up our glomerular De disease center. And they have over 10 active clinical trial protocols looking at uh, uh, new treatments for those with glomerular nephritis. And there's a, a Neptune study, which is a prospective clinical study that's uh, collecting data, collecting tissue and biopsy samples in hopes of bringing precision medicine to treatment for nephrotic syndrome. Dr. Alan Pau and Kalyani Ganesan have um, spearheaded our, our new kidney stone center, which is a collaboration with urology and endocrinology and they've taken their clinical work and again, brought it into their research and are looking at novel risk factors for, um, for kidney stones and how, the, uh, how kidney stones might interact with bone disease and cardiovascular disease. Um, and finally, Drs. Jane Tan and Xing Xing Cheng established the Transplant Readiness and Assessment Clinic, which is also known as TRAC. As many of you know, the waiting time for kidney transplants here in the Bay Area can be up to 10 years. And so how do you reassess these patients that you saw a decade ago and decide whether they're still able to get a kidney transplant? And so they were able to create this innovative system where they bring patients in, assess their functional status, and it really led to an increase in the proportion of patients who are active and might potentially receive a kidney transplant. And it has uh, enhanced the success of kidney transplant in areas with long wait times and is being adopted by other centers because of its success. And so I wanted to highlight as well, some of our clinical, uh, more clinically focused faculty. Um, Dr. Fumita Kamal is our director of quality and has many um, initiatives that are aimed at improving the care of patients. I showed on that one of the first slides, we have all these treatments that we know work and yet they're being underused in, in many of our patients. So how do we, how do we uh, move that needle? How do we bring those numbers up? Dr. Brian Brady, um, former CERC fellow, is focused on value-based care. Um, you know, our patients with chronic kidney disease are amongst the highest users of the healthcare system, and that process could be much more streamlined, much more efficient. Um, Dr. Margaret Yu is, has really been instrumental in bringing our APP teams on board, both in the inpatient setting and in the outpatient setting. And I think any of you who have worked with our, our APP teams know that I think they are really held up as an exemplar of how APP teams can be integrated into a clinical program. I will also just as an aside, as many of you know, our, our uh, general nephrology inpatient services are named the Jameson and the Mathley team. And hopefully now after today, you all understand why uh, they were given those names by Dr. Chertow a few years ago. 
Dr. Petrum Fatehi is a unique member in being double boarded both in nephrology as well as in critical care. And much of our inpatient work is in the ICU. You'll often see us basically stopping at every bed in, on J2. And so he's really helped to foster stronger connections between nephrology and the intensive care unit, as well as spearheading our educational efforts as our new um, director of education in our division. And finally, dialysis. So many of you may not realize that we take care of outpatient dialysis, uh, patients on outpatient dialysis from San Francisco down to South San Jose. And so, uh, but that dialysis, that whole outpatient dialysis was really pioneered by one of our very first nephrology fellows, Dr. Norman Copeland, who many of you may, may still remember. Um, and he, in 1973, established California's very first freestanding dialysis unit. Before that, dialysis as outpatient was really still connected to being in the hospital. Patients were dialyzed kind of alone in a hospital bed. And Dr. Copeland uh, created this outpatient dialysis unit. He apparently picked out the lazy boy recliners himself, set up televisions, had you know several patients dialyzing together so that they could talk, they could be a team, um, and had it just be more homey. And that very first satellite dialysis unit, because of the satellite of Stanford, is what later became uh, known as satellite dialysis, and now satellite healthcare, which is one of the very few dialysis providers that remains a nonprofit organization. And it's only fitting that Dr. Graham Abra, who is one of our faculty members, but also a former Stan uh, Stanford uh, fellow, is now tasked with bringing patients out of those dialysis units and into the home setting through uh, increases, increased use of peritoneal dialysis and home hemodialysis. And finally, we're committed to educating future generations. And our educational effort really um, is built on a foundation of our nephrology fellowship, which is led by Dr. Yiming Litt, as well as with our two uh, new associate program directors, Drs. Kamal and Tammy Sirich. And over the last 50 years, we've trained upwards of 250 um, trainees through our program. We're also committed to training the next generation of researchers in kidney disease. Um, and that's through a partnership, not only with nephrology, but also urology and pediatric nephrology. And as Dr. Jamison mentioned at the beginning, RT32 has been continuously funded for 45 years and is ending only because the NIDDK is ending the T32 program. We also have a transplant fellowship that was established in 2006 by Dr. Scanling and is now led uh, by Dr. Ade Taiwo. And finally, we have a new uh, program called the Pre-Renal Initiative, and that's led by Drs. Bala, Fatehi, and Chertow. And that uh, program is uh, focused on undergraduates and is funded by an NIH R25, and its, it's, it's mission is to provide a 10-week uh, summer research experience to these undergrads and to really expose them to medicine, to get them excited about um, research and potentially get them excited about nephrology. And it, I think very importantly, a very large proportion of our first class of pre-renal uh, students um, was made up of uh, people who were from underrepresented uh, populations in medicine. And so on that note, I just wanted to end with talking about uh, a very important topic, and that is that the prevalence of end-stage kidney disease is really um, uh, disproportionately affects uh, populations of color. What you're seeing here is the prevalence of end-stage kidney disease separated by uh, race and by Hispanic ethnicity from 2000 to 2018. And you can see that clearly those who identify as Black or African-American or Hispanic ethnicity are overrepresented when it comes to end-stage kidney disease. And so the reasons for these disparities are certainly uh, multiple and certainly very um, complex. But one uh, area that has been receiving uh, really a lot of scrutiny in the last year and a half is these medical decision tools, these clinical algorithms, and these calculators that may disadvantage Black patients. So as many of you know, if you, have a, if you order a lab and you get a basic metabolic panel, it'll spit out two different estimated glomerular filtration rates or two different EGFRs, one that will be for Black or non-Black. And so what those calculators do is they basically take, if two people have the exact same age, serum creatinine and sex, that the estimated GFR for someone who's uh, flagged as being black, that estimated GFR will be higher 
than for somebody who is uh, flagged as being non-Black. And so what are the repercussions of this um, race variable? So that's a question that uh, Dr. Manju Tamora, along with her fellow at the time, Dr. Uh, Vishal Dougal looked at using two different data sets. So they used data from the NHANES, which is a national uh, survey, as well as data from the VA. And they looked at how this, again, using the race adjustment may impact uh, downstream events. And so if you just focus first on these panels here, they show that the prevalence of CKD stage three among black individuals is much higher when you do not use the race adjustment compared to if you do. Now, the prevalence of stage four CKD overall is much lower, but the pattern remains the same. And they did see that um, the race adjustment did affect up to 40% of black adults in terms of uh, whether they, they would, uh, should have uh, certain very common medications prescribed or not, such as metformin. And so this uh, issue has important med uh, implications, as I mentioned, not only for medication uh, initiation, dosing, or discontinuation, but also may have implications for the timing of getting these people to see somebody in nephrology, timing of when they start to get to accrue time on a transplant waiting list. Right now, you don't start to have time on the waiting list, which as I said, can be up to a decade until that EGFR drops below 20. And of course, someone who's identified as black and has a higher EGFR, they're gonna need to wait a lot longer before they get to that less than 20 threshold. And so in recognition of this issue, our um, national society, so namely the National Kidney Foundation and the American Society of Nephrology created a joint task force in July, 2020. After one year, they released their interim report, which really detailed their process and how they were going to look at the evidence um, and how they planned to move forward. And then just a couple of months ago, in September 2021, there were two articles in the New England Journal uh, looking at this issue, one of which uh, developed a new creatinine and cystatin C-based equations to estimate GFR without race. And uh, at the same time as that, uh, as those papers came out, the task force released its final recommendations. And I wanted to point out that we were um, in parallel with what was going on a national level. We were also doing our own work on this issue here at home. And I just wanted to really um, recognize the work uh, of some of the interns at the time, now second year residents, namely Drs. Pearson, Wren, Steele, and Ume, who came to me and you know, brought up this issue and said, what, what are we gonna do about it? And they really helped to, to energize our efforts. We put together a task force, including the four uh, residents, as well as some of our fellows and many of our faculty. And I really wanted to highlight Dr. Rafik Bowen, who's the co-director of the clinical labs here at Stanford, because he really did tremendous amounts of work in um, being able to bring to fruition the uh, ability for us to um, be ready to implement the task force recommendations. It was just very lucky timing. We had done a lot of the, the work already and we're, we were poised to make some changes just literally like a week or two uh, before the task force uh, you know, gave their final recommendations. And so we were perfectly positioned to implement. And so we will be uh, calculating EGFR, any creatinine-based EGFR using the refit equation that was just uh, published in September, 2021 without race. There will also be an opportunity for you as providers to order something called a cystatin C EGFR panel. And you'll get two different EGFRs if you order that panel, one using a CKD epi with cystatin C only without race, and another EGFR that's calculated using a combination of markers, namely both creatinine and cystatin C. Um, and that was able to be brought about because Dr. Bowen and his team brought the cystatin, cystatin C assay uh, in-house before it was a send out test and would take many days. And so clinically it was very difficult to use, but now it's in-house, it'll be much quicker to turn that around. And we anticipate that the implementation date will be December 1st. There'll be more detailed information coming from Dr. Bowen and from his team. Um, and so I do wanna point out, um, however, you know, when might you think about ordering cystatin C? Cause that may not be as familiar to those of you who aren't nephrologists. 
So the at this point, the reasons to order a cystatin C would be in patients in whom you are concerned that a creatinine may be less accurate. And those are really at the extremes of muscle mass and extremes of body size. So the really, um, you know, bodybuilder types, as well as the cachectic patients that you have. Um, creatinine, importantly, can also be influenced by things like a high protein diet the night before, creatine supplements, um, certain medications like trimethoprim and cimetidine that inhibit the secretion of creatinine and can um, art artificially elevate serum creatinine levels. So statin C, for those of you who don't know, is um, a, a small protein that is freely filtered at the glomerulus, similar to creatinine. But unlike creatinine, it's not secreted. It's not dependent on muscle mass. And it doesn't seem to have any extra renal elimination either. And so for those reasons, may be a better marker of GFR than creatinine. But it can be affected by things like thyroid dysfunction and corticosteroids. So it's not necessarily a perfect marker either. And I think the other thing to remember, and this little caveat will will show up on the lab test as well, is that there's gonna be substantial imprecision for any estimate of GFR. And that's why it's an estimate, right? And the other thing to remember that it's only applicable when the kidney function is stable. And that's true for creatinine and cystatin C. And so even though you can calculate an eGFR, it might not really be that meaningful for someone who's in the middle of having an acute kidney injury episode. And that really clinical decisions shouldn't necessarily be in, you know, made based on one number or one cutoff, and really you have to look at the whole picture. But despite those caveats, I, I am proud of the fact that as a kidney community, we were uh, the first to really take race out of a very widely used clinical algorithm, and that we at Stanford are going to be able to um, implement those changes in a very thoughtful and evidence-based uh, way. And so with that, I'll end. I just wanted to thank our administrative team. They like to do fun Zoom theme backgrounds. I mean, this was their glam one. And so I wanna thank Winnie, Jocelyn, Sydney, Kayla, and Lynn, who all helped with um, putting this presentation together. And really just a, a debt of gratitude to our co-founders, Dr. Jameson and Dr. Roy Maffley, as well as to all the others who have really helped to establish uh, Sanford Nephrology as the division it is today in these 50 years. And really the faculty, the fellows, the students, the nurses, the administration. I mean, it's just, it's a, been a tremendous effort. It's been a wonderful 50 years and I look forward to the next 50 years and I'll stop there. Thank you. Thanks so much, Dr. Chang, Dr. Chertow, and Dr. Jameson. That was amazing. Uh, Dr. Harrington had to run to an equity meeting. He was mentioning how this is such a great overview. He, we, we, he was even wondering if we should do this for many of our divisions as well. But you know, I've just reminded I've been at Stanford for 14 years. Uh, I came a year after after Glenn came, and uh, um, just looking at the slides, how um, many amazing faculty members we have in your division. Thank you so much for your leadership, for Dr. Churchill's leadership, for Dr. James's leadership as well, um, for being a huge part of making that possible. There's some questions popping up. I wanted to hop into that. I also wanted to just highlight a few uh, comments that have been left. Uh, Dr. Jamison, one of your medical students, Dr. Yesevich, uh, said uh, hello, he, and he's been part of Grand Rounds a lot the last couple of years. So just wanted to make sure you saw that. Dr. Mahoney had some great comments. The most recent one, so proud to be at Stanford. Uh, um, Dr. Skoulos was really excited about the uh, um, GFR revamp. I think all of all of us are. So we're look, looking forward to seeing that those changes. I'm going to hop over the questions. And uh, Dr. Salas, I saw your question as well. I'll get um, Dr. Solomon. Uh, Mary Solomon says, when I was a med student in the 1970s, it seemed like a third of glomerulonephritis cases ended up with a diagnosis of glomerulonephritis of unknown etiology. How has this changed over time? And thank you for the great review. Yeah, I, I guess I could take that one first. I mean, I. I think it's true. When you see something that's just chronic interstitial nephritis, it's a very nonspecific, um, you know, diagnosis, if you will. And it's not even, you know, it, it doesn't say really much about the etiology. And I think that's where efforts like um, the Neptune study, which uh, I mentioned earlier, and there are many other initiatives now to get tissue and to really um, not just chalk things up to 
hypertension or other of these kind of wastebasket terms and to really um, potentially do more biopsies so that we can start to really use some of these new techniques to try to understand the, um, you know, the actual factors, genetic or otherwise, that may be contributing to some of these things where right now we just see it and we say, eh, chronic interstitial nephritis, um, you know, kind of NOS. I don't know, Glenn if, or Rex, if you had anything else to add. No, but I, I love the shoulder shrug. <laughs> uh, no, I have nothing to add. Excellent. Uh, there's a few uh, questions here regarding uh, the refit equation. I'll go to the first one that's mentioned. Uh, how does the refit equation relate to 24-hour uh, creatinine clearance measurements, and why not do the 24-hour urine collection tests? Yeah. Um, so, you know, we do do 24-hour urines in some cases, but um, for those of you who have ever done them and for those of us who interpret them, those are potentially even more fraught with... Um, with risk of, of inaccuracies. It's very tricky to properly collect urine for 24 hours. A lot of times you get these results that you know show that clearly the patient either under collected or over collected and it can be quite burdensome as well on the patients to collect these urine samples over and over again. And at the end of the day, you are still basing that on creatinine, um, which has all of those um, potential uh, problems um, that I mentioned earlier that you know muscle mass, et cetera. Um, so for those reasons, we tend to, you know, we want to find something that's easy, that, um, you know, doesn't burden the patient and that we can, you know, check uh, over and over again if we need to. Another, a few questions along the same lines, and I'll just mention, uh, uh, thanks Rhonda for your comment. Uh, they, she's just mentioning they're a model of how APPs can and should be used, and Glenn responded to that. Thanks, Glenn. Um, the question here, uh, does the refit equation without race consideration still show differences when viewed as a function of race? So say unlocking a race blinded calculation? I'll let Glenn, do you wanna take that one? Yeah, forgive me, I'm, I'm not quite sure what you mean by that. Yeah. Why don't I do this? I'll, I'll, there's a few questions um, along those same lines. I'm going to mix in a few of them as well. Um, what was the what uh, is I, was I, the evidence origin for using race adjustment in the estimate formula? Yeah, I, I can take that one and also just answer Dr. Chu's question. Um, particularly in our region, I think we we do need to think about about uh, sub subcategories of race. So for instance, in our region, we care for many, many patients of Tongan in particular and Samoan uh, heritage. And there's a dramatic increase in the risk of progressive kidney disease among the Tongan and Samoan communities. Um, so uh, there, there's, there are also some very important health disparities vis-a-vis um, access to kidney transplantation among different, um, different groups of Asians uh, that we should potentially talk about at another Grand Rounds. The, the reason that uh, the equations were fit like this in the first place, uh, the first such study was the modification of diet and renal disease study or MDRD. And the entry criteria for the study included a measured GFR uh, through a substance known as iothalamate. And there were about a thousand patients who screened for that study and had iothalamate measured GFR. So it was a very clever opportunity to, since measuring GFR is a bit cumbersome, iothalamate's not too difficult. It's not nearly as challenging as some of the methods Dr. Myers and others used 20 and 30 years ago, uh, but it's cumbersome enough that uh, it was thought that there would be great benefit from developing a regression equation that could estimate that GFR. And it turned out that, um, that patients who self-identified as black tended to have higher measured GFRs at the same level of creatinine. And the reasons for that are unclear, 
but I think Dr. Chang highlighted some of the some of the consequences that could have developed as a result of that classification. There was a question here from Dr. Salas. Uh, I was wondering the same thing. Do you think there'll be a shift from creatinine to cystatin for a measurement renal function? Will it be the new creatinine? I think that's where we think this will be headed. Um, you know, I think we're lucky to have people like Dr. Bowen who were able to bring cystatin C to us, but most places still, it's, it's very challenging to get cystatin C. There's also the issue of insurance companies covering the cost for um, cystatin C. And I think there is still, you know, there are still questions to be, um, that need to be asked and answered about um, how well cystatin C really does perform. Um, before uh, you know, it, it takes over as the new marker. But I think that that is where many of us think that this may be headed. That's a really exciting. Uh, it, we just hit nine o'clock, so I think I'll, if it's okay with you all, we'll, we'll close it. But thank you again, Dr. Jamison, Churchill, and Chang for uh, the great presentation, and more importantly, a, a, a great, a wonderful division years of, of leadership. So thank you so much for this and sharing uh, with, with everything this morning. Uh, everybody, thank you for sticking with us as usual. Thank you to our panelists for being back with us as well. Hope everybody has a great rest of the day and week.